this uh, last session of today. Uh, it's going to be uh, Genaro Hernandez Mada from the University of Sonora. He's going to talk about crystalline representations, lecture one. Please, Genaro, take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for being here. Um, before, before starting properly with the course, um, I would like to say that uh, I just found, found out that last week, um, one of my professors for, from, for the PhD, um, he passed away and I just found out um, a few hours ago. So I'm still in shock about that. And I would like to dedicate this course uh, to his memory. Um, yeah, that's it. Okay, so let me let me start properly now with the course. Um, remember, uh, if you were in, in Rogelio's uh, Rogelio's uh, course, um, he yeah, he he talked about uh, be admissible representations, and he said uh, B can be one of several rings, and he talked about uh, the BHT, B hot state, and and he mentioned uh, other three period rings. And so the, one of the purposes of this course is to define those uh, three rings, B the RAM, PDR, uh, B Chris, and BST. Okay, so th that would be the first thing that we are going to do. We are going to define those three period rings. Um, we will see that this uh, will allow to give a classification of Periodic representations of, I'm sorry about the typo, uh, of GK, um, where GK is the absolute uh, Galois group of a periodic field. So I'm, I'm mainly interested about the periodic field case. Okay. Um, and uh, finally, we are going to explore some geometric situations in which uh, these representations are, are useful. Um, are you are, are you seeing my screen? We are, but Juan doesn't seem to be seeing it. What? I, I have no problems with your with your presentation. Try to to reconnect Juan. I see oh yeah. He says uh, he found. It. Okay. Anyone else have has problems? Okay. So yeah, mm, this Piadic, uh, so in general, we can say that Piadic Hodge theory uh, is about this. It's about uh, studying this Piadic uh, Galois representation that Rogelio just introduced. But normally they arise in some geometric situations, okay? And, and normally uh, we use them to study geometric uh, problems. And so that's what we are going to explore at the end of the course. So what kind of geometric situations we can study uh, with these Galois, uh, Piadi Galois representations and the classification, uh, this, the crystalline representations and the RAM representations and so on. Okay, but mainly we are interested in this course in uh, crystalline representations, okay? But for that, we, we need to define uh, especially this ring Decrease, which is uh, a sub ring of a BD, of B the RAM. So we need first to define a B the RAM. And so to define B the RAM, we need to, to know V vectors. And so I am going to start with these V vectors. So I will start um, with very basic stuff. I hope that uh, people that are already familiar with this uh, do not get bored. Um, but uh, but since I know there are some people here that uh, they are not very familiar with it, uh, I would like to start with that. Okay, so um, there it is. Uh, so first we're going to define B the RAM and we are going to start with some algebraic background. So the first definition I have here is this one. So suppose we have our ring A with a chain of ideals, uh, I1, I2, and so on such that the quotient A modulo I1 is a perfect ring of characteristic P and such that uh, we have this uh, condition. In that case, the ring A is said to be a P ring. 
if it is separated, just give me a minute. Separated and complete for the topology defined by this uh, chain of ideals. Mm, we say that is a is a strict if P is not nil potent in A. Normally, we require that uh, I I n is generated by the nth power of P. Um, for that for that last property. Okay, so maybe we should see some examples of of this. Mm, so the, the easiest uh, example is this one. So the ring of piadic integers with uh, the the nth ideal would be the the ideal generated by the nth power of p. Okay, so that is a strict p ring, as I said. Um, normally, the string have this property that the nth uh, ideal is generated by by the nth power of uh, p. And so I think it's uh, it's obvious that uh, it satisfies this these conditions. Um, and well, it's very well known that it is separated and complete for, the topo for that topology, for the piadic topology. Um, okay, so yeah, that's the easiest example, the ring of piadic integers. Um, more generally, we could take a piadic field, a finite extension of QP, and take the ring of integers uh, and the same. The nth idea would be the generated by nth power, the nth power of p. That is a strict p ring. And uh, just to mention, just to mention that uh, if we take the same a, so this one, um, but we consider instead of the ideals generated by powers of p, we could take uh, the ideal generated by the powers of a uniformizer, right? So I'm denoting like this, the uniformizer. Uh, so in that case, we get a P ring, but it's not a strict in general. So it would be strict uh, if and only if uh, the extension is unramified. Mm. And this is another example that is going to be useful for us. If we take the ring of integers of the field CP um, and the nth ideal to be the generated by the nth power of P. So again, it's a strict P ring. Okay, so these are like the more basic examples, um, but there's another one that uh, we are going to need and it's also very well known. So let me put it in the next uh, slide. Mm. So let's take uh, an index set, J, and we consider this uh, polynomial ring. So the variables are indexed by, by J but we are going to take uh, n p, p roots of the variable and of the p roots and so on, okay? And with coefficients in the ring of piadic integers, zp. And then we take the piadic completion of this ring, okay? So we take the projective limits of these quotients, and that is a strict p ring with, uh, with the ideals um, the nth ideal generated by the nth power of p, okay? So this example is going to be useful in what follows. Mm. So let me state this uh, lemma. Mm. It says uh, that if we take a p ring with the residue ring R and we take a sequence uh, of elements in R with this property that uh, the i plus one th element elevated to the pth power, pth power uh, gives uh, xi. And for each i, we take a lift of xi to a. So remember, r is the residue ring of a. Um, we can take a lift uh, of each element. Then this, this sequence, the sequence that we, we, we have yn to the power p to the power n, okay? That sequence converges to some element in A, and more importantly, that element depends only on x, okay, on the sequence. So it does not depend on, on the choice of lifts that I have, okay? It depends only on, on the elements of the sequence. Um, 
So I have here the proof. Let, let me just sketch it. Um, I will not give uh, go into too much detail because this is just a um, uh, technical lemma. So what we do is that we check uh, by induction on K that uh, we have uh, this condition. So Y, y n to the power P to the K um, minus Y n minus one to the power P to the K minus one is in the ideal I K. Okay, so there, there I have the, the condition for k equals one because it's by induction. Um, and well, this is the, the inductive part. I will not uh, say too much about that. We use the completeness. We use the completeness of A. And the, the important of this is this. So we need to prove that the limit y depends only on x. So what do we do here? So we take an, a different uh, choice of lifts of xi. So here, suppose that uh, yi prime is another lift of xi for, for each i. And we are going to consider a sequence that, that we mix both, both of them. And we apply a, a similar argument as we did for the original one, and we can we can repeat exactly the same, and we get again that uh, the, the 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 limit has to be y. Okay, so yeah. So now the 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 important case that we are going to consider is the the case in which the ring R is perfect. So recall that uh, a ring is perfect when the Frobenius when the Frobenius uh, morphism is an automorphism, okay? Mm. So in that case, if I take an element in R, call it alpha, we can take the pth root of alpha, right? And we can take the pth root of the pth root and so on. So we are, we are constructing this sequence. So remember, remember that we need in this lemma, we need a sequence of elements in the ring R, okay, with uh, this property. And we get that for each uh, lift, uh, sequence of lifts, and this other sequence converges to some element that depends only on X, okay? So I am going to take this sequence. So I start with uh, alpha, and then I take uh, the, root of alpha, which I can do because, uh, because R is perfect. And I take the pith root of that element and so on, okay? So there we have the sequence. And by the lemma, we get the, an element Y and that uh, is called the type Mueller lift of alpha that Rogelio already mentioned in his course, right? Um, and usually it's denoted like this, okay? The type Mueller lift for, for alpha. So we just need to consider this sequence. And, uh, and what we do, if you remember, we take a lift for each of these elements, we take a lift Here. We take a lift and we raise to the power this, and we take the limit of that sequence. So this lemma says that this sequence always converges. So the slides will be on Sulips if you want to check all the details on the proof. Mm. Okay. So a good exercise that uh, we could discuss in the in the training sessions um, is this one. If A is a strict P ring with perfect residue ring R, then for every alpha, there exist elements in R, alpha N, such that alpha can be uniquely written in this form, okay? So this is a very interesting uh, exercise because it tells me that uh, in that case, I, I have a, a representation of all the elements of, of this form, right? Okay, so now 
we are going to apply the, the previous results to this ring. So recall that this is uh, one of the examples that we have for strict P rings here. So it says for any, for any index set. So it's basically this one, right? Mm. So it's residue ring. So this is my A in the lemma. This is my R in my lemma. This is the, the residue ring. So I just take uh, uh, quotient modulo P. Mm. And by exercise one, this one, there exist elements that I denote like this in the residue ring. So these are these uh, alpha n, right? Such that if I take a sum of this type, so I take the type Mueller lift of um, xi of the variable xi multiplied by p to the i, I said I do the same for yi, I take this sum. So this is an element in A, right? Oh, I mean, in this one, this is an element in A. And um, so by the lemma, by the exercise, sorry, um, I have a representation of this type. So I have the existence of these elements, um, alpha n. So that I denote by SI bar, okay? And if I do the same, but for the product, instead of the sum, I get the same result. I am going to denote by PI bar those uh, those elements of the residue ring. And a good exercise is just to compute to compute uh, S zero, S one, and so on. So the first the first one. So I I'm giving them here um, just to have an idea of what what kind of things uh, we obtain. Okay. Mm. And now we have the following uh, lemma that if we have a, an index set J, A, a strict P ring with perfect residue ring R, uh, we take a ring homomorphism uh, theta bar from, from the residue ring to, um, of SJ. So SJ uh, well, I didn't denote it, sorry. SJ bar would be the, the with FP here, okay. Now it's Q. Mm. Okay, to R, a, a ring homomorphism, and we take um, any multiplicative lift. So this is not necessarily a ring homomorphism, just a, multi, just a multiplicative, but it's a lift of, of theta bar, okay? Then there exists a unique ring homomorphism from, from the strict P, P ring, sorry, that I, that I just defined uh, in the previous slide, I think uh, you remember, um, to A, that uh, it behaves like this, okay? So it behaves well with respect to the tag Mueller lift, that's the point, and, uh, and with the theta map. And so the proof is uh, relatively simple. We just need to define uh, a ring homomorphism from SJ to A in a very natural way. Mm. And that extends, well, we need to check that it extends to a ring homomorphism from the completion. This is the Piadi completion of, of SJ, yes, mm. to A. And now we can check this by induction and apply this to x to the p to the minus n and k equals n. So if we take k equals n here, and we, in we instead of x, we have this, what we get is this. And this is in this ideal for all n. This is for all n because we apply the, the result for all n. And well, this implies this, that it behaves well. So uniqueness follows from, from the fact that, uh, that it, should, it should respect the, the sum and, and yeah, that's it. Mm. So now we have this other um, technical result. If we take A, a P ring with perfect residue ring R and we are given top also a finite uh, collection of 
elements in R, X and a finite collection of elements in R, Y. Uh, then we have these relations, these relationships where SI bar and PI bar are the polynomials, well, the elements that I obtained uh, here. Okay. So you can see that the relationships, uh, those relationships that we have are going to be a consequence of that we have these relationships here, right? So basically we just need to apply the, this lemma, this lemma to a well-chosen theta bar, which is just this, okay? So we need to, to send the, the, the variables to the, to the elements xi that I took here, okay? And the same with y. And the leaf is going to be given just by the tag Mueller, tag Mueller. And so the, relation, the relationships are obtained by the ones of pi and s i bar, okay? So yeah, that's, that's relatively simple. Mm. So I have this other exercise um, that I, 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 will, I, will be, I will be giving some, some exercise during the course so that we have some, some stuff to discuss in the, in the, in the training sessions. Mm. So I have this, uh, suppose that I is a perfect ideal in R, then if I define this uh, W of I as the set of these sums where XI is an element of I, this is a closed ideal of A. And if I take the quotient, uh, this is a strict P ring with residue ring R over I, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now um, we can we can uh, define well, yeah, we can define the ring of bit vectors. I have this theorem. If I take R, a uh, perfect ring of characteristic P, then there exists a unique strict P ring W of R. This is going to be the ring of bit vectors um, with residue ring R. And moreover, if A is a P ring with residue ring S and I take a ring homomorphism from R to S and a multiplicative lift of this theta, theta bar. I think I made a mistake here. Uh, then there, um, then there, there is a ring homomorphism theta from the ring of bit vectors to A such that this. So, so this is, so this is something like this. So, we have the ring of bit vectors mm. and if we reduce we get uh, r right mm. so that that's the the ring that i'm going to to construct in this theorem mm. but the the important thing is this if i if a is a p ring with residue ring s and i have here So this thing characteristic P, right? It's a ring homomorphism. And this is, so S is the, the residue ring of A. A is a strict P ring, it's a P ring. Okay, so this is reduction modulo P, reduction modulo P. Um, and I have here, uh, a multiplicative lift a multiplicative lift of um, of theta bar so there will be one over here this is the the theta. Such that if I start here with an X and I take the type Mueller lift and then I apply this theta, I'm going to obtain the same as this lift. Okay. 
So this is just uh, applying the the previous result with the appropriate uh, ch ch choice. So I am going to take uh, a presentation of the ring R. So I can I could do like this. So I could take uh, J as the whole ring R, and I the appropriate relations so that we have this presentation for a perfect ideal I. Um, and we define the the ring of bit vectors as this quotient, where W of i is the one that I defined uh, here. Okay, so remember the exercise. It says that what we get is a strict p ring with residue ring r over i. So, so then we get uh, what we want. We get a strict p ring W of r this with residue ring r because of this. Okay, so it's what, I, what, it, what it says here. And so now what, what, what we want to do is to, to prove um, the other part. So consider a, a ring homomorphism from R to S and a multiplicative lift. So just uh, the, the situation that I was describing here. So this and this. Um, I think uh, the number is not uh, was not well compiled, but uh, we get uh, a lift of the composition. So so it's this one, right? Mm, because yeah, we extend to the completion. So that's. That's what we get here, I think. Mm. Just give me a minute. So this composition is This is J was a representation of R. Sorry? You, you choose SJ bar as yes. a representation of R. Yes, exactly. With, we, and the kernel of the representation was I. The, yes, the kernel of the representation was I. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's just by the lemma that we can extend. Yes, yes. So, sorry, I, I, I got uh, confused with that. Okay, so I'm, I'm just gonna, gonna say, so yeah, this is, this is exactly the, the theta that we needed uh, up here because this, this W of R I was defining it to be this one. Yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, yeah, so that, that is called the, the ring of bit vectors or R. So for example, uh, the, we, we could take a, a perfect field, right? Um, let me just, because I, I didn't write some examples, but so the most uh, famous example of uh, the ring of bit vectors, so if, I, if I take R, the perfect field, the finite field FP, then the ring of bit vectors is It's just the ring of Piadic integers. Okay. Mm. Okay. But, but then uh, we, we might uh, ask ourselves what, what do we do if the ring R is not perfect? 
okay? Because uh, these uh, bit vectors uh, behave uh, and they work uh, very well in the perfect case. But uh, actually, we are going to be interested in the non-perfect case, in the not perfect case. So more concretely, we are interested in defining some kind of bit vectors over the ring of this one. And this one is not, not perfect, okay? So what, what we can do, what we can do is to make it perfect. So taking a perfection for uh, calling it in some way. So in general, if I take uh, A, an FP algebra, um, I'm going to define R of A, the ring uh, defined like the projective limit of A by the Frobenius. So I have A, and A, and so on. So at each step, I have the, the Frobin. So here I raise to the power, to the p power. Um, well, I should say here, why? Why? So, okay. So, I, I, this is just notation R, R of A. So, the exercise is that if A is perfect, then R of A is already, a, I mean, isomorphic. Um, and the isomorphism is given by, by this. So, th th this is kind of easy, right? So, beca because uh, since uh, since A is perfect, A is perfect, uh, then the, the Frobenius is an automorphism. So, so yeah, so just to say that this is, uh, this is perfect and uh, in the case that A is perfect, so we get, we get the same, okay? Mm. Okay, so I have this very interesting proposition because I, I would like to describe to describe the, the ring R of, of this one, right? So I said that this is the one that we were interested in. Um, so the proposition here says that this ring is described as this. So it's uh, the set of sequences of elements in ring of integers of CP with this condition. So, so the, the direct definition of this ring here, the elements would be sequences, would be sequences. I will denote them like this. Maybe this is not very good notation, but. But so the thing here, is that these are elements here, right? Because R of A is the projective limit of A. So the elements are sequences of elements in A. So here A is this one. So what this proposition is telling me is that I can describe it as sequences of elements in the ring of integers, not in the quotient, okay? With this, with this condition here, and that that description is just as a set. So I need to define here um, a sum and a product. And the product is very simple, but uh, the sum might be a little complicated, as Rogelio pointed out uh, today in the morning. He said that when, when when you want to do this kind of things, the sum becomes a little complicated and, and the, the additive inverse uh, is given by, by this. So 
Yeah. Sorry. So the, uh, the, the, just to let you know that you have five minutes until the uh, mini break. And also just to point out that this definition is kind of shocking to me because it looks like tropicalization because you are taking like powers. And if you weight that uh, limit with the inverse of PJ, maybe you get some logarithmic piecewise linear thing in the end. Maybe we can discuss this later. Yeah, that, that would be so you have yes. You have five more minutes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, uh, I, th th that would be a good thing to discuss in the training sessions because I don't know too much about these tropical things, but uh, I, I know that there is a relationship with the, these uh, kind of things. So yeah, that, that, that would be good to, to discuss. Mm. Yeah, so, so here, here uh, if, if, if you see this is uh, a little, I mean, it looks complicated, but we will see in the proof of the proposition that this is actually exactly what we need. But, but it looks uh, weird because uh, you want to define the ith, ith term of, uh, of the sequence. And for that, you take a limit over j of, of this, and this is, is raised to the power p to the j. Um, so it, it, it might look uh, weird, but it's not, OK? So, so I'm going to define a, a ring homomorphism from A to this ring um, in a very natural way, OK? So if I take uh, a sequence here, I can define the sequence of its reductions modulo p. So of course, this is uh, here because of this condition. Um, And we are going to define an inverse. And uh, let, me, let me do that after the break. I am going to, to correct this because I, I have here also a problem with this. I don't know what is, what's going on. So, so yeah, we, we, we will see the proof of this proposition just after the break, OK? OK, do you want to take the break right now? Yes, yes. Okay, let me post the uh, record. Yes. You can okay, start. Okay, so thank you, thank you. Okay, so before before the break, before the break, um, we were talking about this proposition that gives me a, a good, a nice or um, description, description of this ring uh, in this way. And so we are, what we are going to do is uh, to define an isomorphism between the, this ring and this ring, OK, mm, with these with this, uh, operations. So from A to this one, it's very simple. It's just like this. So we take just the reduction modulo p um, in each component. And for the inverse, what we do is this. So for, for each. Uh, for each xi, I am going to take the sequence of uh, y i plus one, y i plus two, and so on. Uh, well, x i plus one, x i plus two, and so on. And then take, take a lift for each of them. It doesn't matter um, what, uh, what lift uh, we take because of this lemma that, uh, that we had in the beginning. Let me just put it so we can see it. This one. So it says here that if I take a, a sequence of elements in the residue ring with these uh, conditions, and for each i, I take a lift, right? So this sequence converges to some element, and it depends only on the one that I took uh, in the beginning. So So that's what we are doing here. So we are taking a, a sequence of lifts. We are raising to the power p to the j. And then we take the limit. And that depends only on xi. OK? So 
if you see what we have here is exactly what we need. Is, the, is, the, is that sequence for, for the sum, for the sum, right? So, so it's not that weird. It's, it's actually what we, what we actually need. Mm, and, and yeah, so that, that's it. So be, because when we, see, when we see that the inverse is given like this, it's clear that, uh, that it's going to, to be an isomorphism because it's the inverse, right? Okay, so I have, as a corollary of this, we have that uh, this ring is an integral domain because the product is uh, component to component, right? And this is, uh, this is an integral domain. So, so it works very nice. So that, that was not clear. That was not clear from the original definition of this ring, right? Because this is in characteristic P. So it's not uh, that simple to assure that when we take this projective, this projective limit, we are going to get an integral domain. Um, but but when, with, this, with this description, well, we, we get uh, exactly that, okay? Mm, yeah. And also that description, the description of, of uh, the ring, of this ring that I'm going to denote from now on by just R, um, we can define a valuation there just like this, the p-adic valuation of x0 because x0 now is an element of, of the ring of integers of CP, right? Mm. Right, so here, here I am thinking of the elements of R as the elements of A in this, in this proposition, okay? And well, the, the exercise now is this to prove that this is actually evaluation on R. Mm. And we have these, these properties that they are also exercises. Um, if we take uh, two elements in the ring R, this one, uh, satisfying that uh, the valuation of X is greater or equal than the valuation of Y, then there exists an element Z uh, in the ring R such that X is equal to, to Y times Z. And it turns out that R is complete in Hausdorff with respect to this valuation, the topology that defines this valuation, that this valuation defines. Um, and if we have, um, for each N, we have a YN, a lift of XN, which is an element of this, I could take the valuation this element thought as a sequence of elements like this. And that valuation, it would be this link, okay? So now the p-adic valuation of yn, yn the lift, and then multiplied by p to the power n. And the limit of this, that, that would be the valuation. So that's an exercise, I, I think that's very nice. Um, okay, now we would like to describe also the field of fractions of the ring R. So, yeah, so look that R, the ring R can be described as this kind of, of, of these sequences, these sequences of elements in the ring of integers of CP, of CP with, and uh, that satisfy this, this condition. So this theorem uh, tells us that uh, those sequences uh, I'm sorry, that uh, the elements of the field of fractions can be described as sequences uh, very similar to those, but uh, the elements the, the, of the sequence are going to be elements of CP. That's very natural, right? Mm, instead of because CP is the field of fractions of, of uh, o, OCP. And the important part of this theorem is that uh, this is an algebraic, algebraically closed field of characteristic P. Okay, so I am going to sketch uh, the proof of the algebraic, algebraic, sorry about the typo, algebraically closed property. Mm. So normally we would need to, we would, we, we, we would need to take um, a polynomial and prove that it has roots 
in the field of fractions. So we may assume that uh, it's a polynomial in, in R by multiplying by a, an appropriate uh, power of P, for example. And so we are going to suppose that uh, PDX is, has this form. And so now each of the coefficients of the coefficients are, are elements of the ring R, right? So I can think of them as sequences of elements uh, here. So here I am thinking of the, of the coefficients of the polynomial as elements in the ring here, right? Yeah. And so for each K, so K goes from zero to D minus one, D is the degree of the polynomial. Um, for each K, I have a sequence AKN of elements like this. So what I'm going to do is for each N, I am going to consider this polynomial. So I am, I am fixing the, the N here. So it's like uh, projecting to, to one of the, to the nth component in this sequence, right? Mm. And so this gives me a polynomial PN, which has coefficients in this ring, right? And I am going to take a lifting of this polynomial to this other polynomial, polynomial ring, okay? And this one has roots in OCP. That's the important part. And because of the condition, because these, these coefficients are in the projective limit, so they satisfy that if I raise to the pth power one of them, I am going to get uh, the preceding one. I have this, this property. So, this is very, very simple, right? If I raise this to the power P. Since we are in characteristic P here, it's like raising to the pth power everything. So I am raising to the pth power here and here and here. And here. And here. Right? And so what I know, what I know is that if I raise this to the power P, I am going to get N minus one here because those coefficients came from here, from a projective limit. Mm. And the same here, and and so I get the n minus one polynomial evaluated in the in x to the p, right? So I have this this relationship, and so what I what I'm saying here is that I can put inside here one of the roots of the polynomial, and I'm going to get this zero modulo p, okay? So in particular. I have this product is uh, zero modulo p, right? Because uh, this is the this is the this is the polynomial, the polynomial p n minus one, uh, this one with this thing here, um, factorized, right? So I'm evaluating this, and this is zero modulo p. That means that uh, the valuation of this is uh, positive. And so we get that there exists a j such that the valuation of that thing is uh, larger or equal than this. And then we can use induction to prove do this in, in more generally. Mm. And then we, we take uh, the special value x equal, uh, I mean, k equal d. So we get uh, here, um, yeah that uh, the valuation here by k equals d, I get uh, p to the d minus one to the p, this is p to the d, and this is p to the d minus one. These are th those things that are here. 
And so they are congruent modulo P. And, um, and yeah, so that means that we can take, uh, after maybe reordering the, the roots of P, we might take the projective limit of these things over N, okay? M modulo P, modulo P. And so that would be in the field of fractions of R. And, and well, the claim is that this, this element in the, fra in the fraction field of R, those are the roots. Um, those are the roots of my polynomial P, okay? So this is just the sketch of the proof. I mean, that's, that's the way to, to, get, to get the roots of the polynomial P. So just to know how to prove that this field is algebraically closed, okay? Okay, so something else that we are going to, to say about this ring R, uh, not only that this field of fraction is uh, algebraically closed and not only that we can have those two descriptions that we just said, um, it's that uh, this ring R comes equipped with a Frobenius map that uh, can be defined like this, just raised to the power P, the first uh, component. And well, the exercise is to prove that the elements of R that uh, um, in which this Frobenius map is the identity is just F. And if K is a periodic field, then in GK, the absolute Galois group, then GK acts on R. And uh, I mean, in a very natural way, right? We can, we can take the action in each component and we can prove that the elements that are stable under that action are just the elements of the residue field of K. Okay, and the last exercise that I'm proposing here is to prove that what, what I already said, that the bit vectors of FP is just the ZP. Mm. Okay. Now, we know we know that uh, R is perfect. And so we can take its ring of bit vectors, right? Uh, if you remember, we made a construction for the bit vectors for, in the case of a uh, perfect uh, ring in characteristic P. And so, and so we can do that. And this ring uh, comes with a Frobenius too defined like this. So here uh, I, am, I am using the description of W of R. Where is it? Here. Mm. Like that. So, so the definition of the Frobenius is just to apply the Frobenius to each of the xn and take the tag Müller lift, and it should be it should be okay. And and also we have a GK action given in the same way, just uh, to each of the xn. And so here the exercise is is this one. So the elements in which the Frobenius is uh, the identity is just the ZP. And uh, the element able uh, by the GK action, these are not okay in general. Um, it would be okay zero, where K zero is the maximal unramified extension. Okay, so in other words, the intersection of K with with the un unramified closure of uh, QP. Okay, well. Mm, so we have Frobenius and we have a GK action for the ring of V vectors of the ring R, where R is this uh, special ring, the perfect perfection of OCP modulo P. Um, and um, we can define a ring morphism that I'm calling theta from the ring of V vectors to the, the ring of integers of CP um, in this way. So I'm just taking 
I'm just taking the zeroth part of uh, CN in, in here. That, that's what I'm denoting here. Maybe that's not the best notation. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, so here we are going to apply theorem four, theorem four. This one. So when we have the ring of B vectors, excuse me. Oh yeah. Um, when, when we have the ring of B vectors and we have um, a morphism, a ring homomorphism from the residue field, residue ring of the of W of R, I mean with what we started, to the residue ring of A, and we have a multiplicative lift from R to A, we can get something from the ring of bit vectors to A. I, I mean, I, I had a diagram here that I drew in red, but it's it's gone now. So that's what I was looking for. So yeah, okay, never mind. So this is what I'm. This is what we are doing. So we are just uh, starting with uh, something from R to the residue ring of this, which is this, of course. And we are going to take a multiplicative lift from R to OCP. That's what we needed to apply the, the, the theorem for. And what we get is something that goes from W of R to OCP. And so theta bar is uh, very simple. We just take the zero component of, or the first component of X Mm. And theta, I mean modulo p, modulo p, because it goes uh, to here. And here we are, we are thinking of R as elements of here. Um, the elements x should be in the in the um, description that we made as sequences of elements in OCP, right? So that allows us to define this this uh, multiplicative lift from R to OCP. Right? Uh, yeah, so this is very clear that this is a multiplicative lift. And so by the, by the theorem directly, we get, we get the map that we, that we want. So, so the, the important thing about that map or the special thing about that map theta is that it can be extended to a GK equivariant surjective ring homomorphism from this to CP. So, so in, if we invert p, if we invert p here, we we get a surjective thing to CP. So that's that, that's the the point here, and so we can give an explicit description of that because uh, in this ring we we have a description of this type as sums that start in, in a negative, uh, negative uh, coefficient. And so this is, this is basically the same, the same morphism. So it is clear that, that it's an extension of, of theta, of the original theta that I obtained here in the proposition. Mm. Okay, and, and if, we, if we endow this ring, this one, with the topology, for the topology that gives me the kernel of this map, uh, that turns out to be Hausdorff. Okay, so that's a good exercise. Mm. And okay, so now we are ready to define the the ring, the ring that it, that is usually denoted like this, B D R plus. And we just need to take the projective limit of this ring, modulo the powers of the kernel of of theta. Mm. And the big theorem about this is that this ring is a complete discrete valuation ring with a maximal ideal the kernel of uh, theta. Its residue field is CP. And as a uniformizer, we might take uh, any choice of, of uh, generator of the principal ideal. I mean, the theorem says that this is the, I mean, uh, That, that that's kind of uh, natural that that's going to be the maximal ideal, right? Because just by definition, 
Um, okay, so here we need to make a, a remark, a very important remark, is that the Frobenius here um, does not stabilize the kernel of theta. So we cannot extend that Frobenius to this ring, unfortunately, or fortunately, if you, depending on if you're an optimistic person or not, but um, we will fix this problem um, later on. Um, for now, I would like to state some, some facts about uh, this, uh, this ring, okay? So, so we don't have a Frobenius here, but we do have um, an important uniformizer that uh, it's this one. So if I take uh, epsilon, epsilon is this element of R that is just taking uh, the, the roots of unity with the roots of unity. It turns out that this series converges in the DVR topology and the topology of discrete valuation ring in this ring to a uniformizer. So this is some kind of logarithm of, of this element, right? Mm. Yeah. So that uniformizer, we are going to denote it by T. Mm. I'm not uh, going to prove this. The proof is actually um, maybe a little long. You need to prove, you need to study a little bit uh, properties of this epsilon. Um, but uh, this is something we might discuss if you are interested uh, in, the, in the training sessions. Um, if not, uh, I can give you a reference. And th th there are some notes, uh, very, very good notes by Olivier Brinon here um, and Brian Conrad that uh, about a course that they gave in a summer school a few years ago. And that's a, I think it has become some kind of standard reference for these kind of topics. Um, so yeah, that's a very complete reference. You, you might check some details about everything that I have said uh, there. Mm -hmm. Well, something else um, about this uh, is uh, that if G, if G is an element in the Galois group, uh, then G of T, T, this uniformizer, is actually given by the cyclotomic character, okay? Mm. Well, and this is the ring BDR plus, okay? Mm. Now I am going to define what is called just BDR. And this is just the fraction field of the ring out oh, here. I'm sorry, this is BDR plus, okay? So it's, it's just the fraction field of that, of that ring. Or equivalently, it's, uh, it's this ring here, just inverting, inverting T because T is the uniformizer that we chose uh, or that we, that we have here. Mm. It comes equipped with a GK stable filtration given by the powers of T, the, this, this uniformizer T, okay? Uh, in the ring, uh, I mean, multiplied by the ring uh, B plus, the R, B the RAM plus. Okay, so that gives me a filtration, it's GK stable. And in fact, we, we have that uh, if we take the, the graded algebra of this for this filtration, we are going to obtain the BHT that Rogelio defined in the morning or that he talked about in the morning, the, the hot state, okay? Mm, so yeah, so, so here we have uh, a new period ring. R recall that, uh, let me, let me go to the beginning just for a second. Okay, here. So we have defined uh, this one, okay? So how did we define it? So we started with the ring with the ring OCP modulo P, which is not perfect. Where is it? Here. So we started with this ring, OCP modulo P, and it's not perfect. 
So we take its perfection. So we take uh, this R of this and that we denoted by just R, right? We made a description of this, uh, of this ring and um, we saw that it was an integral domain. We, it's a DVR, discrete valuation ring. We saw that some properties about it. Mm. And the most important thing that since this is perfect, we can take its ring of bit vectors. So we took the ring of bit vectors of R. Mm. And then we took this projective limit, okay? Or by the kernel, the kernel of theta, theta defined uh, in this way, which is kind of natural map. Mm. And then we took the, the fraction field of this. And it comes with a filtration and that somehow it's related to, to, the, other, to the other ring period ring that we, we had studied. But so now you might wonder uh, if you remember, if you remember we said uh, that BDR didn't have a Frobenius here because, because the Frobenius in this one uh, does not stabilize the kernel of theta, this one, this one right here. So, so in order to fix that problem, we are going to need to take uh, something smaller, something smaller than BDR, that's what it's called, decrease. So in order to have um, a Frobenius. Okay, so, so just to let you know um, what comes uh, next, but before, before going to the, the other ring, period rings, I would like to, to say a few things about uh, where these uh, the RAM representations appear. So, so the RAM representation, the representation is just a B admissible representation for, for this ring B, BDR. So for example, we have this proposition, see, if X is a smooth projective variety over K, then I don't know, this is et al. The E, the e didn't appear. Uh, so the et al cohomology, piadic et al cohomology of X is, uh, is admissible, is BDR admissible, so the RAM representation, okay? Mm. And moreover, the, the, GK, the GK invariants are just uh, K. So this is uh, the theorem that, uh, well, for, for the case of B the RAM, for the case of B the RAM, uh, it's the thing that Rogelio was, was mentioning in the morning that Pedro, Pedro was uh, questioning. Um, so yeah, so this happens for, for B the RAM. So these two, I'm not, uh, Proving them, these are this as a consequence of the accentate theorem. So this is a deep, uh, this is a deep theorem actually. And again, again, if you want to see more details about this, um, it's uh, you can see the notes of uh, Olivier Blinon and Brian Conrad, and we we might discuss it also in the training sessions if you if you wish uh, to do it. Okay, so. This is everything that I that I prepared for today. Tomorrow, tomorrow we have a uh, second lecture in the morning. We start. We, we will start with the second uh, period ring, which is decrease. Okay, so I will stop here. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me stop the recording.